Mr. Vice President, thank you so much for letting us here in your office today. Uh, so let's start with the jobs report. A monster number this morning. This is a red-hot economy. Give me your sense of whether the administration thinks this can continue. How long can it continue? Well, I guarantee you President Trump has, believes that we're just getting started in this economy. Uh, and, and frankly, it was back in 2016. The president said, look, you let people keep more of what they earn. You, you cut business taxes across this country, roll back federal red tape unleash energy, fight for trade deals that put jobs and American workers first, that this economy had come roaring back. And here we are, April number, 263,000 jobs created. We're coming up on 6 million jobs created since Election Day. And the unemployment rate, unemployment rate at a, at a nearly 50-year low. This economy is roaring. And, and I think maybe most meaningful to the president and me, is the fact that when we've seen wage growth over the last year, the, the most rapid wage growth in these numbers has been among working Americans, like the people I spent time with in Dearborn at the Ford factory, like the people I was just with in Norfolk. I mean, working Americans are winning in the Trump economy, and I couldn't be more proud. So it's a hot economy. The Dow has been on a tear, with the exception of yesterday. The Dow has been on a tear this whole year. Isn't this when you really want to be raising interest rates, ultimately, to keep the economy from overheating, to help savers, uh, to get things under control? Well, not at all. In fact, I think the president suggested the opposite. This might be a time for us to be considering about lowering uh, interest rates. But look, we just, we just don't see any inflation in this economy at all. But, but, you know, back, back when I was in Congress, we had a whole debate uh, about the dual mandate of the Federal Reserve, and it might be time for us to consider that again. The, consider the, the, the fact that, that the Fed looks at full employment and monetary policy and inflation, and instead, by just looking at inflation, you'd make it clear there's no inflation happening here. The economy is roaring. This is exactly the time not only to not raise interest rates, but we ought to consider cutting. So you'd like a single mandate for the Fed, just focus on employment. It's something, you know, it's not something the president and I have talked about, but yeah. back during my days in Congress, we considered it. But just, just having the Fed just focus again and you've had on monetary policy and, and recognize that, that their job is to essentially manage that. And, and, and watch inflation. Because you just, Eamon, you just don't see any inflation right. in this economy right now. And the fact that wages are growing, the fact that we're seeing jobs being created all over the country and businesses large and small should be an encouragement to every American. And, and I, I hope also to uh, uh, the people that operate our monetary policies. So well. Herman Cain, Stephen Moore, you've had two yeah. of the president's picks now for the Federal Reserve Board flame out. Is the president just picking the wrong people, or what's going on here? I think the president uh, is very interested in bringing fresh ideas uh, to the Federal Reserve Board. And I think as you see him make nominations in the future, he's going to be bringing people in that, that will, will, will bring a, kind of a renewed uh, and fresh perspective. That's what both of those men represented. Uh, there's a process that we go through here in Washington, D.C., respect Steve Moore's decision to withdraw but what the president's really looking for is people that understand the, the dynamic approach to this economy that he's been putting into practice since the first days of this administration. And remember, so it, it really is, is remarkable when you think about it, just real quick, sure. Eamon, you think it, it was early 2017, Larry Summers, the top economic advisor for the Obama administration, said we'd never get to 3 percent growth. He talked about you'd have to believe in the tooth fairy for that. Well, no, you just had to believe in President Trump's agenda for this economy. But if you cut taxes, if you get that business corporate rate down to a competitive level globally, just like we did, if you cut federal regulations, if you, if you unleash American energy, and if you fight for the kind of trade deals that we've been able to negotiate with South Korea that are being negotiated as we speak with China, the USMCA with Canada and Mexico, all of that is coming together to create this dynamic economy, and we're just so, getting started. So what is the president looking for for the Fed board? Is it political loyalty to him personally? Is it a commitment to low interest rates? Is it a commitment to shake things up there? What does he want? I think the president's looking for, I think he's looking for men and women to be appointed to the board of the Federal Reserve who are as fiercely committed uh, to the free market as he is, the, the belief that that this economy can expand at a rate that we haven't seen in many, many years. Look, we just so came off. The, the, absolutely, is part of it, 
but it's just simply recognizing. Remember, remember how many times, Eamon, we heard about the new normal in the last administration? An administration that the most powerful economy in the history of the world grew by less than 2% for eight years. And now, the first quarter of this year, 3.2% economic growth, when you know the first quarter is always the toughest. The reality is, this is a president who has a boundless confidence in the American people. He has a boundless confidence in the ability of this economy to exceed all expectations. And he's looking for men and women on the Federal Reserve Board who share that passion. So you've got two big trade deals uh, hanging in the balance right now. First is China. Right. Are we going to see a deal signed next week? Well, our team just got back. We had a briefing here at the White House yesterday. We're going to be welcoming the vice premier uh, next week, and those negotiations are ongoing. And I think President Trump remains very hopeful. He's got a very good relationship with President Xi. But what he's made clear to President Xi, what, what I've made clear in my interactions traveling through the Asia-Pacific last year, is that things have to change. I mean, while, while we hear the, one, of the, one of the latest candidates for president say that on the Democrat side say that China doesn't represent a competition to the United States, Eamon, you know that they're half of our international trade deficit. And forced technology transfers and intellectual property theft are a reality. President Trump has made it clear that things have to change with China on the structural issues as well as the trade one imbalance. Of those, one of those we'll continue to stand firm on those. One of those structural issues is hacking, Chinese hacking of American companies. There was a report this week that the president's willing to drop his demand that the Chinese stop hacking American companies. Is that true? I haven't seen that report. What, what I can tell you is... Is he going to demand that they stop hacking American companies well, as part of this deal? We've made it very clear across the board that things have to change with China, whether it be the debt diplomacy uh, through the one belt, one road policy that they're advancing, uh, whether, it be, uh, uh, whether it be freedom of navigation, particularly in the South China Sea, where we've asserted uh, America's interests there in new and in renewed ways, or whether it be domestic political interference. All of that is a backdrop to these trade negotiations. But we, what we want is a better relationship uh, a more honest, a more level relationship with China across the board. And President Trump believes that be, by beginning, by resetting our trading relationship, by literally bringing China up uh, to the standard that other nations around the world live up to with regard to intellectual property and forced technology transfers, that we will begin a process so let me of addressing through, all those issues. Let me tick through a couple of other topics here. You've got the USMCA. You've got Republican senators, including Chuck Grassley, who say you've got to drop tariffs in order to get USMCA through Congress. Do you think that's the right approach? We're, we're dealing with members of Congress, uh, productive meetings yesterday on just this issue. But look, the, the USMCA is a win for American jobs, and it's a win for American workers. do you have the votes? Workers. Uh, we're, we're working it. Working uh, on it. Look, I, I have every confidence, as the president does, that if Speaker Pelosi puts the USMCA on the floor, it'll pass. But look, look we're, we're going we're to work with Democrats in Congress. We're going to address issues raised by Republicans uh, as we move forward on this. But make no mistake about it, I'm a guy that comes from the Midwest. I remember when, when NAFTA was signed into law, and uh, it, it was a real education for me through my career, where I always, just as the president is someone that believes in free trade, I always had a bias, a reflexive bias for free trade, but I saw the way NAFTA hollowed out communities in the you, state of Indiana. We saw jobs heading south of the border. The president made it clear NAFTA had to change. We renegotiated the deal in a way that puts American jobs and American workers first, and uh, we have every confidence going forward. Uh, that if Speaker Pelosi will schedule the USMCA for the floor, it will pass. We'll address the issues in the Senate, and we'll put we'll put even uh, we'll put even uh, uh, greater momentum into this growing and expanding American economy. On China, is it a possibility that we get to a deal? There's a big signing ceremony. We see the two presidents, and yet there are still some American tariffs remaining in place afterward. Or are all the tariffs going to be pulled out? Well, I think the whole issue of enforcement is a part of what's being discussed right now, Eamon. Um, whether or not, uh, you know, the president's imposed... So is that a yes or a no? Well, <laughs> the president's two favorite words are, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but, you know, we put $250 billion in tariffs on. The president believes we're in a very strong position. We could put more tariffs on if, if we're not able to reach an agreement. But, uh, but the, the, the manner in which tariffs would come off is going to be a part of an enforcement mechanism, and all of that is a subject of negotiations as we talk. 
Let's talk about Venezuela for a minute, because mm -hmm. the administration has been saying all this week, with all the chaos that we've seen there, that all options are on the table. Does that mean an American military option is on the table in Venezuela? And do you believe the American people would support the U use of American military forces in Venezuela? Venezuela was once the second most prosperous nation in this hemisphere. And because of dictatorship and oppression and socialism under Nicolas Maduro, now nine out of ten people in Venezuela live in poverty. Three million people have fled the deprivation of that country. Uh, my wife and I met with refugees during visits to Colombia, during visits to Brazil. And it's it's the, the poverty and suffering in that country at the hands of the dictator Nicolas Maduro is unspeakable. And now with the, with the violence that we saw on television this week, four is people that lost their lives. Is U.S. military force? Is that is U.S. Uh, military force on the table here too? Well, it, it, look, all options have been on the table now for two years. I mean, in my first trip to South America, President Trump had already made it clear that, uh, that we reserved all options in, in dealing with what, what literally is a failed state in Venezuela. But look, we hope for a, we hope for a peaceful transition of power. I've, I've met with President Juan Guaido, the legitimate president of Venezuela. Uh, uh, who is recognized by the National Assembly, the Constitutional National Assembly. It's one of the, one of the things that uh, we, we bristled at this week was the suggestion that there was a coup underway in Venezuela. Uh, the National Assembly was duly elected by the people. And Juan Guaido was named president under their constitution. His efforts this week are all part of a process of the legitimate president of Venezuela, taking the reins of control. We've now, we've, to... we've marshaled diplomatic pressure. Now, we were the first country on earth to recognize Juan Guaido as the legitimate president. I had the privilege of calling him the night before and telling him of the president's decision. The next day, he would take his oath. More than 55 nations have joined us in this cause. We've put unprecedented sanctions on individuals in the Maduro regime, on enterprises in Venezuela. And as I said, President Trump hopes for a peaceful, transition of power and we are going to continue to engage nations around the world diplomatically and we're going to continue to use the levers of this economy and economic sanctions so, to until Nicolas Maduro goes and Juan Guaido is established as the president of Venezuela. Your predecessor, Vice President Joe Biden, got into the presidential race this week. Yep. Uh, he says that your tax cuts for the rich, he says, haven't worked and that people don't notice them in their daily lives. Is he right about that? And how do you think this 2020 campaign is going to go when it comes to taxes and the economy? How are you going to push back on that? Well, I, I, I don't often quote the Washington Post, but I think they gave Joe Biden's statement for Pinocchios. I mean, the truth is the jobs report this morning, 263,000 jobs created, the lowest unemployment rate in nearly 50 years tells a different tale, but, but He says it's going to be a battle for the soul of America. Do you think that's right? Well, I mean, are you I, going to be battling for the soul of America as well? I think, look, I think the choice that we face in the country today is a choice between freedom and socialism, increasingly. President Trump has been advocating an agenda that's built on the principles of freedom in the marketplace with lower taxes, less regulation, more access to energy, better fair trade deals, but increasingly whether it be Joe Biden, whether it be Bernie Sanders, whether it be Elizabeth Warren and others in their party, they're advocating an agenda, a socialist agenda of more government, higher taxes, and the same tired policies that created the malaise of the last administration where you saw less than 2% economic growth. Look, we, we really believe that uh, you look at what's happening in this economy and, and, uh, and that we really believe that's a great story to tell. And, I can't wait to get out on the campaign trail, whoever the Democrats nominate, uh, and take our case to the American people. All right, Mr. Vice President, we'll leave it there. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it.